Hey guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to quickly talk about BIOS flashing, uh, well, quickly, I hope, but BIOS flashing on Vega cards, not just Vega 56, so that's what we've been hearing a lot of news about, uh, but as well as Vega 64 and Vega 64L, because while you cannot go and make a custom Vega BIOS, we do have a lot of Vega BIOSes to play with, and some of them have benefits over others, and there's also some other trade-offs, and we'll go into that as soon as I, I thank uh, alza.co.uk over here uh, for providing the Vega 64 that I've been testing with. So a huge thanks to them for sending in the card because like this video would not actually be happening without them um, as there are some pretty major differences between the Frontier Edition and the Vega 64. Also because in my, the couple attempts I've made at flashing various RX BIOSes on the Frontier Edition have all failed, whereas I can flash pretty much any RX BIOS onto the RX 64 I have. So huge thanks to Alza for providing the card to allow all the testing. They're a big European, uh, you know, e-tailer, and they've recently got an overclocking equipment section. So you can get things like liquid uh, liquid nitrogen pots from Kingpin Cooling, uh, binned CPUs they've started getting into, as well as, you know, other, well, they're, there's, they're a general computer and electronics retailer, so... You can find all kinds of stuff there as well. And they do plan to expand the OC sections into more things than just what they have right now. They're sort of starting on the overclocking stuff. So that's really cool. Uh, definitely check them out. Uh, and yeah, huge thanks to them for providing the card. Now let's get into the actual BIOS stuff. So first let's talk about the Vega 56 um, and the modification that's most popular, which is to slap a Vega 64 BIOS onto a Vega 56. And I think this is a great idea. If you have a Vega 56, you should go definitely go grab a Vega 64 BIOS and put it on your Vega 56. And the reason why you should do this is the Vega 56 BIOS has 1.25 volts uh, HBM voltage. That's the actual like voltage that the HBM runs on. That's not the voltage slider in Wattman. I actually have no idea what that slider is uh, is doing because it doesn't affect any of the external VRMs on the on the card. Like they're not affected by changing the memory voltage in Wattman. Um, so I'm assuming it might be some kind of on die voltage, and it still doesn't really affect overclocking. So I don't know why it exists. Um, but Vega 56, for the actual VRM that powers the HBM, which, well, unfortunately, I don't have a naked Vega, Vega card sitting around right now to show you which one that is. But the, the Vega 56, it runs its HBM to on 1.25 volts. This significantly limits how far you can overclock it, as most Vega 56 cards are topping out around 950 megahertz, whereas Vega 64's... Um, I mean, both my Frontier Edition and my 64 hit 1100 megahertz on the HBM, as long as I keep the card under 80 degrees centigrade. The HBM is pretty temperature sensitive. So if you exceed 80 degrees, it starts artifacting pretty hard. The other thing is it's supposed to... I've also read that it's supposed to loosen out the timings. I've just not had a chance to test that. Uh, well, confirm it, because I decided to try test that on the Liquid Edition BIOS and found out one of the... That's how I found out about one of the drawbacks of the Liquid Edition's BIOS. But the big benefit is, like, going from the V56 BIOS to the V64 BIOS, you get 1.35 volts HBM, which means you can... A lot of Vega 56s hit 1100 megahertz on that v, uh, V64 BIOS. And in terms of actual performance benefit, you're going to be looking at maybe 5% performance increase um, going from 950 megahertz, which would be what a normal Vega 56 BIOS would do, to that 1100 megahertz that a Vega 64 BIOS can do. Not all cards will hit this, but a lot of them are hitting 1100. So, um, you know, results may vary, but I, I think there's a pretty good chance most people will hit 1100 as long as they have enough cooling. Enough cooling is not the reference cooler. It's not big enough, but uh, unless you significantly undervolt the card um, to keep it under that 80 degrees centigrade, which is just like... The Fury X only came with an air cooler, people complained... I mean, water cooler and people complained. Well, now you got an air-cooled Vega and it, it's too hot. It, it, the HBM complains when it gets warm. But, you know, whatever. The other benefit to flashing a Vega 64 BIOS to a Vega 56, which has only come up recently, is that some Vega 56 cards pick up extra compute units. Um, there's reports of a Vega 57, effectively one more compute unit than a Vega 56. 
There's uh, reports of a Vega 58, so two more compute units. And I'm sure there are, like, there's probably a good chance that you'll see anything between a V56 and a V64. Like, any of those could end up happening if you flash a V56 with a V64 BIOS. I, I don't know the probability. I personally wouldn't bet on, uh, like, you know, I wouldn't bet on buying a V56 and praying that it unlocks to a V58 or something like that. Uh, and ultimately, the extra shaders really don't make much of a difference in performance. Not as much as the uh, voltage bump in uh, for the HBM and therefore the, you know, increase in overclocking range on that. Um, because as I said, if you manage to hit that 1100 megahertz, that's like plus 5% over 950. Which... I'd just like to, just a side note on the, the HBM overclocking. A lot of people are saying, oh, Vega is horrifically memory bottlenecked. It's not really horrifically memory bottlenecked, because this is a 15, like, going from 950 megahertz, right, which actually on Vega 50, uh, 64, it's 945 stock. You go from 945 to 1100 megahertz, that's a 16% clock speed increase on the memory. It yields about 5% more FPS. That's way below linear scaling, right, with, with clock speed. On the other hand, the core, if you do a 10% core clock increase, which nobody has managed, like, I've not seen any Vega 64 air card do 1760 megahertz core, because that's a 10% clock speed increase. That would yield about 6% more performance. So, you know, it's like core overclocking yields more performance performance per percent overclock it's just you can't overclock the core very far um but yeah so you know v56 if you flash a v64 you get much higher hbm clocks and you get sl potentially slightly more compute units the other big difference is that the vega 64 bios comes with a 220 or a 200 watt power limit um, as vega 64 does have two bioses like every vega card has two bioses and the main difference between those two BIOSes is that you get different power limits. V56 has a 160 and a 175 watt BIOS. Um, V64 has a 200 and a 220 watt BIOS. Unfortunately, none of these stock BIOSes are actually high enough power limit to max out a Vega card properly, like fully max out a Vega. Uh, in my experience, you stop seeing performance improvements with an effective power limit of about 350 watts. That's way, like, that. that's, uh, for, for comparison, the 220-watt BIOS of Vega 64 with the maxed-out power slider in Wattman is only 310. Um, so you do actually still see imp improvement if you do a registry mod to get more power limit on Vega 64. And in fact, th this is why I wouldn't really do the BIOS flashing if you want a higher power limit. Because the registry modification with the power play tables works so much better, and you can set whatever power limit you want. So that, that's that's my recommendation there. Um, and for Vega 64, if you're going for just max performance, power consumption be damned, you'd want to set a power limit between 350 and 400 watts effective. So I've been benchmarking my Vega 64 and Frontier Edition on plus 100% uh, power limit. Even though technically plus 75% should be enough, it's just like I set the power, like I made the power slider go all the way to 100%, so it's easier to just slap it to 100 than try to fine tune it to 75. It doesn't make a difference. Um, because ultimately the card will pull as much power as it needs, and as long as that power is less than 440 watts on plus 100%, it's not going to power throttle. Um, so... Yeah, you know, don't flash the BIOSes for the power limits, it, do it doesn't help. Which, the Vega 64 Liquid Edition BIOS, that one comes with a 220 and a 265 watt power limit. Um, that one actually, like, that BIOS at stock is already pretty good. Um, it also comes with a nice boost over the Vega 64 and the Vega 56, where you have a max core voltage of 1.25 volts, which I think is really, really cool. The only downside to the V64 Liquid Edition BIOS is it has a 75 degrees temperature limit. And contrary to what Wattman with the registry edit may lead you to believe, that 75 degrees uh, temperature limit is enforced BIOS side. Not, what, like, not Windows side, because I was testing 
Like I tried to test the whole HPM performance degradation above a certain temperature range. And every time my Vega 64 hit 75 degrees with the liquid edition BIOS, it would just shut down uh, instantly. Max the fan speed shuts down the card. Really not a pleasant experience, but you know, I, I mean, it is for the liquid edition. It's basically a fail safe if the pump were to, if the cooling system on the liquid edition fails somehow, the card hits 75 degrees, it's, it's just gonna shut down. So that's pretty cool that that works. Um, it's really annoying that, you know, there's no way to disable it on an air-cooled card. So if you're on the stock cooler, using the Liquid Edition BIOS is just not going to work for you because the card's shut down under extended load um, because the air cooler is just not big enough. But if you're on something like, say, the Prolima Tech Morpheus, I mean, this is a Ragin Tech. I keep mixing it up because Prolima Tech is like the, they make the MK26 which is all like the other giant air cooler. Uh, and for some reason, I find that one more memorable than this thing, even though I actually own this thing, whereas I only know about that one from pictures. This is a Ragin Tech Morpheus 2. This fits on a Vega card. The main issue is you need to figure out how to cool the VRM afterwards, which in my case, I'm doing that by butchering the stock base plate. So that's my Frontier Edition. It has a lot of other modifications, so it's not like I would have been able to fit the reference cooler on this card anymore anyway. But, uh, yeah. Um, that's my solution to VRM cooling on that thing. But if you're doing it on your own card, you might want to, like, you know, you might want to go with, like, permanent uh, thermal adhesive to glue on heat sinks. The main issue is um, the MOSFETs on the Vega cards have exposed uh, drains. So... If you have a metal heat sink, like if a p if some metallic thing contacts the drain of one of your MOSFET, like if you put anything metallic, uh, well, anything that's touching ground and the casing of a MOSFET and is conductive um, is going to short the card out. You're going to have a really bad day if that happens. But anyway, this video was supposed to be about bile smutting, so let's go back to that. So, you know, if you have a big air cooler or a water block on a Vega 64 or a 756, you might want to slap the Vega 64 Liquid Edition BIOS on it because it does give you that a higher V-Core limit. It also gives you that 1.35 volts HPM. Uh, the 265 watt power limit sounds great until you realize that once you bump up the core voltage, you'll need an even higher power limit than what that offers. Um, just because 265 watts does translate to about 400, but... Uh, I don't I don't think that's enough I've not managed to test it but I don't think it's enough to have a 400 watt power limit on the 1.25 volt BIOS so you might want to look into a registry edit there as well which I will be a doing which I will be doing a separate video on because it's it's like a whole separate topic and I want to show how to set everything up so yeah, you know, the main takeaways, if you have a Vegas 56 and it's on air cooling, slap a Vegas 64 BIOS on it, you get better HBM overclocking. That's pretty much, like, the only reason why you'd want to do it. If you're lucky, you also get some extra CUs for free, which is pretty cool. If you're on a Vega 64 or a Vega 56 with water cooling, you might want to slap the Vega 64 Liquid Edition BIOS on it if you're interested in running higher core voltage, right? If you're only going to be doing undervolting, you may as well stay on the BIOS you already have. Personally, I don't really do the undervolting because, you know, I, I, it's actually hardcore overclocking and all. I want to save 200 watts of power. Well, actually, you probably won't even save 200. Maybe 100. Maybe 100. Well... Hmm. I'd have to test. I'm not sure how much power you would save, but... Ultimately, it's like, if I can burn 450 watts to get a 5% higher score in 3D Mark, I'm doing it. <laughs> so, you know, th that's my logic to uh, configuring GPUs. Anyway, um, yeah, that's pretty much it, isn't it? Covered everything. I guess, well, well AMD power limits are a, pl a separate video that I'm planning for later. So yeah, that's it for this video. Thank you for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave a comment down below if you have any questions or comments. Uh, if you would like to support what I do here at Actually Hardcore Overclocking, then I have a Patreon. 
um, as well as a PayPal. There's also shirts. You can find all of that down in the description below. It's under one link. Um, and, you know, one last time, huge thanks to alza.co.uk for providing the Vega 64 that I've been using for testing. Um, and I have been nagging them about potentially getting a four-way set up. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> so, that's it. Thank you for watching, and goodbye.